but for now, it is my very pleasant duty uh, to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Nathan Wood uh, from History Department. Uh, he received his doctorate at Indiana University and has been teaching uh, with, uh, in 2004 and has been uh, teaching at uh, KU uh, since 2005. Uh, his uh, first book, Becoming Metropolitan Urban Selfhood and the Making of Modern Krakow, was published in 2010. He has uh, also done a lot uh, since then, and some of his uh, recent uh, Publications include a, ma a main station at once from Door, Bicycles, Automobiles, and Dreams of, Re of Personal Mobility in Poland, 1885-1939, in the collection uh, Migration and Mobility in the Modern Age, published by Indiana University Press. And uh, also uh, Another recent publication is uh, The Polish Athens, The Little Vienna on the Vista of the Big City Krakow, Imagining Krakow Before the Great War. Uh, his uh, presentation today is based on uh, his uh, current book project, which explores many different aspects of mobility and travel by people from Poland, including those traveling by bicycles. And <laughs> Nathan, of course, is a very avid cyclist himself, so this is remarkable <laughs> when one has an opportunity to combine a personal passion that keeps you healthy and fit with a <laughs> fascinating research project. So today he will be telling us about his research on Kazimierz Nowak, uh, who was a Polish traveler who crisscrossed Africa in the 1920s and 1930s. I think it's a really wonderful and fascinating topic and I really look forward to that. My one uh, apology and request is, as uh, since I teach a class at uh, one o'clock, mm -hmm. I will need to leave a little early, and therefore, if you have questions uh, uh, for our speaker after the main part of the presentation, we might need to have it as a self-organized event. And of course, uh, as always, as all of our brown presenters, Nathan gets our mug and pen as a memento and an appreciation for the wonderful work that he's doing. But for now, I will shut up and give the floor to Nathan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vitaly, for the introduction. Thank you for the, the mug. My daughter broke one of these, so I'm happy to... to uh, I'm delighted to see you here. Thank you for braving the Saharan heat today, um, the walk up the hill this, uh, this morning with all of these books uh, was, was miserable. Uh, but nothing, of course, compared to, to uh, what uh, Kazimierz Novak would have experienced in his five-year trek across Africa. So from November 30, uh, 1931 to November 1936, the Polish cyclist, photographer, and explorer Kazimierz Nowak traversed some 40,000 kilometers across Africa by bicycle, on foot, on horseback, on a camel, by boat, uh, from Tripoli uh, to the Cape and back uh, along a different route up to Algiers. So for a sense of perspective, this is the equivalent of four round trip uh, road trips from New York to LA and, and then one more back to LA. So this is really quite a tremendous uh, distance. Here is uh, a slide, a, ma a map showing his journey. Uh, and uh, there's a picture of him on a camel in that sort of last leg before he got back on a bike. At the oh, I'm so sorry. I changed it on mine, not yours. <laughs> Thank you, people. OK, there you are. So here's his journey. <coughs> um, and you can see him uh, astride uh, a camel. He had two dromedaries, one of them carrying his bike so that he could get back on the bike um, on the other side of, uh, of the Sahara. Though he did ride his bike uh, across the Sahara with caravans on the opening leg of his journey, uh, stopping at various um, oases and sort of chatting with the locals 
to figure out the the uh, the best route. And you left the, the camels behind when you pulled the bike. Uh, yes, he sold the camels, and uh, he could have sold them for meat, but he felt bad about that, so he sold them to one of the people who was on the journey with him. Um, <coughs> and just for comparison, here is a cycling cap now for. Um, what, $17,000 just about. One could ride from uh, Cairo to the Cape um, next spring if you're interested. So January to May. Uh, it would cost you, as I say, $17,000. You're going to spend four nights uh, in a hotel and the remainder camping. And it says that the difficulty is four out of five dots, so moderate. Um, I should have thought to do this for my sabbatical, right? <laughs> the, instead of instead of writing this article. So um, <coughs> this this is a cap from a, from the 2013 expedition. Their literature doesn't mention Novak, so I'm going to contact them and tell them that they need to acknowledge uh, this the intrepid Pole who did this um, by himself without a support group, uh, without catered meals in the in the 1930s. Um, okay, so during his five years away from his family, um, Novak suffered numerous bouts of malaria, a lion attack, um, and affairs involving quicksand and a waterfall. While he clearly loved wending his way alone through unfamiliar terrain, sleeping in a tent, and surviving by his wits, Novak's retreat from civilization was clearly much more onerous than, say, uh, Thoreau's two years on Walden Pond. Uh, I learned recently that Thoreau could go home in the afternoon and get <laughs> cookies from his mom <laughs> if he wanted to. Uh, um, Novak, on the other hand, his diet was limited uh, to tea, manioc porridge, eggs, and whatever else he could scrounge, including, he once wrote, a fair share of mice. Uh, the five-year journey clearly took its toll. In, 19, in July 1933, the 36-year-old taped three preternaturally gray hairs from his beard in a letter home. So you see here. It says, hairs from my beard that have turned gray from stress. Uh, and in October 1937, less than a year after his return home, he died of pneumonia contracted in the hospital where he had undergone an operation for periostitis in his left leg. The repeated bouts of malaria had made him weak. Uh, generally, when he was doing his speaking tour of Poland upon his return, um, the crowds would all, you know, sort of stand up and applaud for a long time, and it took him quite a while to make it to the stage, and then he would generally sit. Sometimes he would have to pause, but he would speak at times for three hours and uh, to rapt attention, the news reports say. <coughs> but he was clearly weakened um, by this trip, and it was likely all, all of that uh, damage to his body that caused the uh, inflammation in his leg that sent him to the hospital that autumn. In his prolific published reportage, painstakingly collected and edited, edited by Wukash Wierzbicki, and first published as a book in 2000, so this is the book that came out in 2000. So Wierzbicki, whom I met this summer, an absolutely wonderful, delight, delightful human being, um, hosted me in his house, um, fed me pizza, let me play in the backyard with his, with his, uh, 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 with his sons in their Hot Wheels cars. Um, <coughs> he, uh, he had heard stories of, of uh, Novak from his grandfather, who read the press reports in the 30s. And uh, in the 1990s, Wierzbicki was working in a bank. Uh, and one day, he decided to go to the library and try and find some of these original stories. Uh, and it became a mission for him. Eventually, he quit his job at the bank and uh, collected uh, this slim volume. Later, um, the publishers, uh, the Schmeider family, the Soros pu publishers, um, were able to get a hold of Novak's papers through a long protracted process of getting to know the, fa the remaining family members. And then they obtained the papers. Uh, and at that point, they had m many more materials. They found more articles. Um, and this is one of three volumes of uh, letters from Africa published uh, in his correspondence to his wife. I'll talk more about that in a minute. 
Um, and the uh, book, as you can see just by the thickness, expanded uh, dramatically and sort of the, the amount of material that Wierzbicki had. This is the seventh edition and this is the English edition. When I began working on this project, I was working with the Polish edition, um, translating all of the passages. And then I was about two thirds of the way through the book and found out the English language edition had come <laughs> out. Um, my sister read the English language edition in its entirety before I even did. Uh, she was visiting, she borrowed it, borrowed it, took it on a road trip. This is the library copy, and uh, I have been planning for a long time to make this announcement. I'm going to send it around the room. Uh, Norman Saul has a great precedent of sharing his materials during these conversations. So I'll send it around, um, along with some other materials in just a minute. And then afterwards, I'm going to return it to the library, and it's whoever gets there first uh, is welcome to, uh, to check it out now that I have my own, my own copy. Um, okay, so in his publications, as well as in his letters, Novak preferred the wilderness to civilization, and he cast a skeptical eye on the colonial Europeans he encountered, whose motives struck him as exploitative, ruthless, and debauched. So uh, in my talk today, I want to explore Novak's complicated relationship with, um, um, with modern European civilization as its avatar, a white cyclist riding a bicycle using a very modern camera, and critic, a Pole whose sympathies with the subaltern were readily apparent. Um, in an era of dramatic technical and physical feats, think of Gertrude Ederle swimming across the English Channel or Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Novak represented a relatively low-tech and personally supported form of exploration. Without state support uh, or a team of technicians or local porters, Novak represented the outer limits of what we might call um, vagabond tourism. A phenomenon that was increasingly popular at this time, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, as people hit the road on foot or by bicycle with little money or resources to support them. So I'm going to argue that his uh, background as uh, a veteran, as an underemployed Pole, uh, who was of course a European but not from a colonial power in Africa, as well as his mode of travel, by bicycle without state or corporate support had a great influence on his point of view, his perspective uh, as he processed the complexities of Africa. Um, at times he seemed to share the prejudices of his culture and time, uh, while at others he was like his compatriot Joseph Conrad a few decades before, a sharp-eyed critic of the racism and rapaciousness of colonialism and global capitalism so nakedly manifest in Africa. So in drawing our attention to uh, Novak's status, this sort of liminal status, um, I, I, I'm furthering a line of argument that was advanced by Brian Porter Such in this very chair, or at least this spot, a few years ago when he was talking to us about his book, Poland in the Modern World. Um, as, as Brian reminds us, Poles, quote, consistently fall below the ranks of the privileged, but well above, above the global norm. They are not part of the club of imperial powers that have dominated the world during the past few centuries, but they don't quite fit into the category of colonized subjects either. This in-between status, he asserts, makes Poland a useful portal for anyone hoping to view the broad tendencies and characteristics of the modern world. And I think Novak illustrates this theme neatly. He was enamored with his bicycle, a technology which was no longer cutting edge in an era of airplanes and motor cars, but which certainly marked him as a strange outsider uh, when he rolled into the remote uh, villages in the bush. Um, here's the, uh, air, an airplane that he, this is one of his photographs, um, rarely visited by colonial authorities. Frequently, natives would run and hide when they saw Novak ride up, something that he attributed to his steel steed, but which just as likely had to do with his fair skin, pith helmet, and long beard. In fact, it seems that many villagers would have already seen a car or airplane by the time Novak arrived. So he was a privileged European due to his literacy and connection to maps, international postal services, and technology, and yet due to his poverty, both colonial officials and rural black Africans often didn't know what to make of him. 
Uh, he could not afford to, to pay tips for guides or offer gifts to the villagers who often fed him. He, in, in many respects, this was one of the things that, that really caught my attention as you read his account. He sort of expects the villagers to help him out. I mean, after all, he's done something very strenuous in arriving in their village um, by bike. Um, and they're, they're like, well, uh, you gonna give us a tip? Are you gonna, you gonna pay us for this? And he's, he's often, he often seems really confused at how rude they are for not, for not helping him out. And I asked my hosts about this this summer, the, the various um, polls who've, who've been involved in sort of bringing his story back to light. He's, he's quite a celebrity now in Poland. He's very, very popular. Um, uh, and and, and we, we reflected that some of this might be from a Polish tradition of goszczynność, or, or sort of hospitality to a guest, that, that there's a saying in Polish, uh, a guest in the home, God in the home. There's this sense that when someone visits you, you, you treat them well. And that's what, that's what Wierzbicki did to me this summer. You know, he, he treated me very well uh, when, when I visited him. Um, but I also think it has a lot to do with this mode of travel I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, this sort of what, I, what I'm calling vagabond tourism. The sense of just going out without resources to support yourself and hoping on others to uh, to help you help you make it. Um, so so he's he's privileged and yet they're not quite sure what to make of him. He rankled at tariffs and duties as he crossed borders. He once complained that people said, "Oh, you know, it must be terrifying to be in the land of lions and 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 leopards and crocodiles." And he's like. No, what's terrifying is passport control. <laughs> um, he, he, really, he really seemed to feel that the, the modern world put limits on his individual freedom. And yet I would say that he was also sort of blinded to the fact that he was dependent on so many other people, uh, as you'll see, his wife in particular, <laughs> for um, answering these letters and publishing his stories and finding uh, the newspapers to publish the, the photographs and such. I'll, t I'll talk more about that. Um, it's really interesting. Whenever he would arrive at a, at, a, at, a, at a village, quite often he, or a city rather, he knew that he needed to take a bath. Um, but he always had bad experiences in hotels. They were always too expensive for him. And by the second night, he was always in his tent on the outskirts of town. And it, this happens again and again. So I think that this, this liminal status in which he's neither a modern colonialist nor one of the colonized was both a benefit and a source of consternation for Novak, making him feel isolated and strange at times. It enabled him to sympathize with the oppressed black and brown skinned people, uh, people he encountered, even if he was himself not free from prejudice, and exhibited what Sarah Lemon, in her assessment of Czech travel writing in the decades before and after 1918, has called non-colonial orientalism. So his non-colonial ori orientalism makes sense. He was glad that Poland possessed no colonies, which made it easier for him to criti criticize colonialism mercilessly. Yet he made his meager living by exoticizing and romanticizing, so going back here, the, the people who had uh, surrounded, who the people and landscapes through which he passed. His knowledge of Arabic, which he gleaned from a previous trip in 1927-28 uh, to uh, Libya, also gave him sort of an in-between status. In several instances, Egyptian or Sudanese officials tried fruitlessly to address him in English, which he did not speak, before finally realizing that he was responding in, in broken Arabic. <laughs> In Novak's telling, these conversations often ended with black coffee, cigarettes, and whiskey, and the men parted as friends. Finally, while his extraordinary journey fits somewhat into the trend of his era to lionize feet, uh, feats of uh, technical and physical fortitude, um, his choice to use a lowly bi bicycle made him more an ecotourist well before the concept existed than a conquering hero. His travel fit much more with the close, uh, closely with the ethos of tramping, it was, as it was often called in this area, or wandering. Um, then with contemporary technical feats of road building and automotive expeditions in Africa, about which uh, my colleague Andy Denning is, is, is writing. So he undertook this journey entirely alone, beginning, uh, he wrote, with only his seven-year-old bicycle, a pen, a camera, and a few dozen zwoti in his pocket. He acquired a tent and other supplies before riding off into the Sahara, and he wisely consulted with local Bedouin traveler, traders over sweetened tea for a hand-drawn map of the desert route he should take. Uh, he also tagged along their caravans 
to and from oases. From uh, photographs, we can tell that he had a fine pair of boots and gaiters. Um, uh, and clearly he had taught people how to use uh, a camera because he's featured in so many of his own photographs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so he must have set the f-stops and handed it to someone and said, okay, press this button. Uh, stand here, press this button. Um, a doctor in Libya gave him sunglasses after identifying damage to his eyes from his time in the desert, and a missionary in Sudan gave him a fine pith helmet thus completing the stereotypical fin de siècle European explorer ensemble, which must have been a bit outdated in the 1930s. Um, before he left Egypt for Sudan in October 1932, his wife Maria sent him a state-of-the-art 35 millimeter contacts camera uh, with which he took some 10,000 photos, many of which he sent back to Polish and German newspapers with the correspondence that helped to pay for his continued journey. When he had been in, a, in Africa for a year and a half, Stomil, uh, the name means 100 miles, um, a relatively uh, young tire company from Poznań, the city that he set out from, and uh, uh, became a welcome sponsor. Though at least once he saw the arrival of their tires as a mixed blessing because he could hardly afford the import tariffs he had to pay upon receipt. In 1936, money sent from Stomil enabled him to afford a new bicycle, his third, and thus keep his journey going. Uh, this sponsorship notwithstanding, Novak had little outside support, as he occasionally told his readers in an effort to differentiate himself from the other Europeans in Africa at the time. Um, he had no state support, no cars, no team of drivers, no porters. He didn't go on the major roads. He couldn't stop and eat ice cream. Um, he has all sorts of mocking asides in his uh, writings about, you know, European biologists who come to a, a lake and dri drive up there with the porter, stand by the lake and have their picture taken. Um, but there is some hypocrisy, of course, because he has plenty of pictures taken of him. Um, and he was very rigorous about only using his bicycle. And he sort of promised his readers that that's what he would use. He was very angry at the Sudanese officials who wouldn't let him ride through the desert and forced him um, uh, to take a train for 620 kilometers um, rather than riding his bike. Um, but in the letters to his wife, he talks about how when he's on a hunting expedition and he shoots some large game, he tells the villagers to go back to the missionaries he's staying with and get the car so that they can retrieve the game. So I'm not saying he's a hypocrite, uh, but, but <coughs> and I do think he genuinely pre preferred his bicycle and, and sort of looked askance at, at these sort of modern machines. But he's also posing a bit, right? I mean, he's, he sets himself up as, as not being like these other Europeans, not using these airplanes and cars for his, uh, for his, his travel. <laughs> So uh, for, for a moment now, I'd like to talk a bit about this, this idea that I have of, oh yeah, so here's just more images of him with his, his kit, his gear. Um, I love the picture of him picking thorns out of his tires um, and his really bare bones tent back there. Okay, so what I want to talk about uh, briefly is this idea of, of tramping or what we might call vagabond uh, tourism. So. Um, Jacek Wuchak, uh, another um, uh, writer whom I met this summer, the author of uh, this book here, which is The Poland of uh, Kazimierz Nowak, um, a sort of a, a cyclist guide. This is a, is, was a delightful book for me. Um, uh, he has lots of details about the various places that Novak visited. And just, just so you understand, he took many bicycle tours before this African one. Uh, major bicycle tours. And uh, so if you want to, you could ride your bike around various places where Novak was and see things that were there when he was there. And that's sort of the way that this uh, text is set up. And I have to say that both in my conversations with, with uh, Wuchak and in my reading of his text, probably the most compelling thing for me was that, that Wuchak sets up the context of, of this period in the 1920s when after the war, uh, uh, people had a hard time finding jobs. Uh, middle class people had lost their incomes often due to fluctuations and in inflation, right? Um, and a lot of people took to the road, whether on foot or by bicycle or by train. Um, and uh, so particularly in the summer months, uh, travelers would depart on foot 
uh, claiming that they were at the beginning of a countrywide or continental or world tour. Um, and um, newspaper uh, editors and journalists sort of commented on this, sometimes more or less charitably. Um, in one instance, uh, one of them said, um, here we are, various figures, whether because they have nothing better to do or because they want to live on someone else's dime, begin a tour of Poland or perhaps its neighboring countries. They do it primarily on foot, by bicycle, or by train, but the principal requirement of these journeys is that they're done without money. Without money does not mean for free, however, because the days of manna falling from heaven have passed. These days, without money means at someone else's expense, on a dime gotten by begging like a gypsy. The journalists observed that many of, the, of these wanderers offered to sell photographs of their journeys for publication by the press, noting that he had two such offers on his desk. Uh, and now I quote again, the public's tolerance for such phonies is truly incomprehensible. It's just another form of begging, no better than the techniques practiced for hundreds of years by professional beggars. It's high time we put an end to this mania for tramping that's become an ec epidemic that th even threatens our children. Another article was, was a little more charitable, and th that first article I cited was um, from 1923. Another one almost a decade later from 1932, and you have to bear in mind this is uh, during the Great Crisis, right, the, the Great Depression, um, uh, wrote, vagrancy, uh, the Polish word wocenstwo, uh, has become a social phenomenon of great importance. The author noted that various castes belong to this group, including some of high culture and education. He allowed that a powerful urge to explore could account for some of the wanderer's motivation to discover new peoples and lands, like Columbus, Cook, or Archeshevsky, who in the 16th, 17th century had uh, ended up in Brazil and writing about it for the Polish audience, uh, before noting that many others traveled because they had nowhere else to live. These vagabonds of necessity were people without a roof over their heads who spend no more than a few days in a single place for whom wandering had become habitual. They find shelter under bridges in cozy burrows or dives, he wrote. They are free birds, vagrants without a place on earth. Yes, that's it. They're people without a place on earth. In Czechoslovakia during this period, tramping, the English word was used, um, became an especially popular phenomenon in which youths would take to wandering the countryside, fancying themselves as American cowboys or pioneers. Uh, some of the popularity for wandering in Czechoslovakia or in, as in Germany arose from a desire to emulate the romantic freedom of the American West as imagined in the wildly popular novels of Karl May from um, about two uh, decades before. Tramping culture was also decidedly critical of capitalism and the indifference of the state. And I, I think that, that this helps me to better understand Novak. I think that he takes on some of this ethos um, after all, he has a job in a bank in Pose 9. He loses that job. He has a bike that he was able to afford when he was working in the bank. And he has a camera. And what comes to him is this idea to, to do a tour of Poland. So this uh, text here uh, was from May 19, 1925. Mr. Kazimierz Nowak of Poznań, who has completed a tour of all Poland on his bicycle, recently appeared in our editorial offices. He, present, he presently will set off on his way to the Near East, from whence he plans to go to India, China, and Japan. Mr. Nowak sustains his travel by selling photographs. Um, he didn't do this at this time. Once he got down to um, Turkey, he went back and then went through Europe and then came back. Uh, to, to Poland. This cartoon was one that uh, Wuchak discovered when he was just trying to look for news stories of one of um, Novak's journeys in, in, in Wuj. And I really love the way that it illustrates um, tramping, this culture of what I'm calling vagabond tourism. So you see in the middle, very prominently, right, a, a, a veteran with his uniform, with his soldier's cap, um, and then this uh, boy, who looks like a, a Boy Scout, this younger or smaller person, has a sign that says, um, sort of, travel around the, or wandering around the globe without money. And he's pulling a little pull toy of a cat there behind him. And then you'll see on the, on the horizon of this, of this uh, stylized globe is a cyclist 
with the lines of motion that are familiar to us from futurist art, right? This, this sort of evidence of, of the speed. But he's also carrying a sign, sort of announcing that he's not just any cyclist, but the, that he's one of these, one of these uh, uh, tra travelers. Um, so there's a context in which uh, Novak undertakes these journeys. He does one in 25 and 26. He does another one in 27 and 28. This is the one where he goes down to Libya and he runs out of money, he gets sick, and he comes home. Um, he sort of fancies himself a correspondent. He wants to write about the war there. Um, he he uh, does another uh, trip around Europe in the late 20s. Um, and he's not the only one to do this. Uh, here are some other examples. This uh, duo here also left from Poznan in 1926. This is Tadeusz Perkitne and Leon Mroczkiewicz. Uh, and they were at the um, sort of agricultural institute, so a uh, place of higher learning, uh, uh, agricultural uh, college. And they went to Sweden, uh, I think really just trying to be day laborers, trying to make a living. And then from there they embarked on a world tour. And uh, they did circumnavigate uh, the, the, the globe. And um, partway through their journey, they managed to acquire a Model A Ford and um, drove it through part of their uh, journey back up, uh, back, to, uh, back to Poland. Um, another uh, group of travelers, so I'm going to pass. This is their, uh, in Polish, but, but you can still look at some of the pictures. Um, and then another group of travelers were this uh, young married couple. Their, their background was much more um, privileged. Uh, they came from wealthy families. And as newlyweds, they uh, took off on a world tour, uh, or I, basically to go as far as they could on a motorcycle on land. And so um, uh, Halina and Stanisław Bujakowski, um, uh, from 19, March of 1934 till May of 1936, I think. No, I'm sorry, August of 34 to May of 36. Um, uh, went in their motorcycle and sidecar uh, on this sort of amazing journey. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, Wukash Wierzbicki, remember the, uh, the person who compiled all of Novak's publications, um, has sort of made a career of this now. So he has published this book as well. Neither of these got published in the lifetimes of these explorers. Uh, so the book that, uh, that I think Andy is looking at or, or was looking at uh, was also published by Wierzbicki. And he has also published a book about uh, that amazing Polish kayaker. Do you guys remember about three or four years ago uh, who he like solo kayaked, um, uh, I, th I, th I think across I think around the globe, but definitely across the Atlantic. Um, and he was in, like in his 60s. I and mean, it's absolutely incredible. So um, ba back to these, these, this, these guys, uh, very photogenic. Um, she's usually uh, smoking <laughs> in, when, her, when her husband uh, takes a picture. Uh, they had a tough time. I mean, they, they kind of ran out of money too, despite their, their privileged uh, beginnings. But there's something to this, right? And then finally, uh, this man here, Arkady Fiedler. Uh, Novak did not know of Fiedler's existence. Fiedler also left from Poznan. So uh, this Poznan seems to have been a hotbed for these global explorers. Um, uh, Novak didn't know about Fiedler until well into his journey in Africa. But Fiedler had already published two books in the late 20s about his travels in, uh, up the Amazon. And Fiedler is a very different sort of uh, traveler. So if Novak's pretense for his travel is that he's a journalist, that he's sort of reporting on the world that he sees, uh, Fiedler's pretense is that he's a scientist. He's gathering, um, you know, like exotic plants and animals. Um, neither of them was really that formally trained in, in these fields, but, but that's, I, I guess, a great way to describe the tenor and tone of their writing. Fiedler is much more literary. He's better educated. You have to remind yourself that Novak and many of his generation had their educations interrupted by the Great War. So Novak didn't get to finish um, what we would call high school, and he didn't get to go to college. Um, and uh, he's, not, he's not particularly literary. He, he has an interesting style. And uh, as with every skill, um, he, he gets pretty good at it because he wrote so much. He had you know, tremendous graphomania. 
So he gets kind of good at it. But uh, Fiedler, it, you can tell, is more educated and more artful in his, in his writing. And, you know, kind of more ruggedly 1920s handsome. Uh, and I'm going to show you some more pictures of Fiedler a little bit later on. All right, so back to Novak. Um, <coughs> so, how, how did this journey work out, and how did he describe uh, European uh, civilization? Well, um, first of all, I'm really amazed at how efficient the press was back then, because he managed to stay in epistolary con uh, contact with his wife throughout the journey. He would just tell her in his letters, send it to this city, post restaurante, I mean, post restaurant, meaning, you know, I'll, I'll pick it up at the post office. Um, and they, uh, I think, uh, Schmeider says they, yeah, Novak wrote more than 2,550 pages to his wife, clumping the letters, which averaged more than one every other day, into 218 numbered envelopes sent whenever he got the opportunity. Uh, he placed himself and his family s in, s in something of a trap of his own making. He clearly enjoyed the notoriety of being a solo cyclist through the African desert, savanna, and jungle, and bush, and relished the challenge of overcoming something so treacherous and difficult without state support. Yes, he al yet he also seemed just as compelled to keep going so he could get letters from home, and his letters to Maria, helpfully edited, collected, uh, collected, edited, and introduced in just the past few years by Dominique Schmeider, frequently contained poignant expressions of longing for her and their two young children. From Albertville in the Belgian Congo, Novak wrote Maria in July 1934 that he was unable to afford a return ticket to his struggling family and had no guarantee of making any better living at home. If he could, he would, quote, bury his, chest, his head in her chest and weep, begging her for forgiveness for the great wrong he had caused her. But given the circumstances, he really had no choice but to press on. While he was in South Africa, half a year later, British authorities offered him a first-class ticket back to Europe. But he declined. As he recalled in an interview with Jennik Poznanski upon his return, I was overcome by fear. When I thought that I could find myself in the polished four walls of the cabin, I recalled the tones of a restaurant jazz band and visions of the silhouettes of elegant gentlemen and ladies swirled before my eyes. I got on my bike and fled." So it's this really interesting dynamic. People often wonder, I mean, about this relationship. He was married, had two children, felt that he was supporting himself and his family by traveling, but he wasn't with them and he wasn't making much money. And it put Maria in quite a bind to have to try, oh, I'm sorry, I was a slide behind, to try to rear the family um, more or less in poverty back home um, and to, here, yeah, here's some example of one of the letters. And then this is a really interesting document here on the right. This shows the, um, the correspondence that he would have had with the press. I'm sorry, that she would have had with the press about how many photos, what stories, and how much she was going to get paid. And you see that there's mention of 211, uh, 221 zwote for this and a 200 zwote advance for some future stories. This is what the stories would have looked like in print. This is an issue of uh, In This Wide World, Nasharokim uh, Shvietche, um, and um, an example of what one of his stories uh, looked like in print. Um, okay, I'm. I'm running out of time. All of this is the new stuff that I found out this summer, and I've been so interested in this, this, this point about tramping. So now, in the, in the time that remains, I'm just going to try to give you a taste of his critique of colonialism <coughs> and uh, global capitalism. So um, he wrote that uh, the Africa that he found, poor, sickly, gray, black, and boundlessly filthy, had revealed a bitter truth about the place that had once aroused in him such feelings of envy for the European nations, but which grew in his soul into a completely justified aversion toward everything that contained the word colony. There were two Africas, he had decided, one for show, 
and another that is generally inaccessible, about which there's nothing in the travel guides, because in order to get to know it takes sweat, hunger, and longing, and a willingness to risk life and limb. This is self-serving, of course, uh, language here. Um, so his travel, he asserts, allowed him access to the second Africa rarely seen. Of course, he passed through large cities as well on his way to the continent's remotest corners, which allowed him to see colonialism sparkle as well as its foul underbelly. In Benghazi, which Novak reached after long and dangerous travel through the Sahara, he took in the markers of a colonial city, paved streets, squares, avenues, everything beautiful and rich. Despite all of this, the city struck him as a provincial town, a truth of all colonial cities, he wrote, which were like bifurca likewise bifurcated between the signs of European civilization and another culture that he called biblical. He saw tumultuous streets crammed with multilingual crowds, Italians, Greeks, Turks, Arabs, Negroes, Berbers, Jews, and God knows what else, black, white, yellow, and unknown skin colors and races. Everyone is chasing after gold, he noted, selling, buying, and above all shouting as if they were trying to drown out the crashing of the sea along the coastline. On streets that sparkle with beautiful, silent beautiful automobiles that startle the napping camels, bringing cargo from the interior country, of the country, he observed a peculiarity of African cities, the lack of white women. The effect of this scarcity, he wrote, was that whenever a European woman, even if she's no Venus, appears on the street, the entire world of men watches her movements. Especially the black natives stop and their eyes seem to bulge from their sockets. According to Novak, because no Europeans lived in Benghazi permanently, they all saw their time there as boring and monotonous, and they sought relief in moral swamps. Things only got worse in Cairo, uh, which Novak saw as a den of iniquity, rife with prostitution, opium dens, hashish, morphine, cocaine, and whiskey, which prompted his observation that, quote, what lower cultures take first from us is our vices. Uh, having made it to the Nile, where water was plentiful, he hoped finally to see a clean Arab, but they were dirty as ever, even when going to prayer, he wrote. Here in the East, the one entertainment is whiskey, sold in bulk by the English. Alcohol is quite cheap, so the people can abuse it as much as they like. Such are colonial politics. Because most Europeans have only read material about the colonies from the colonialists themselves, he told his readers, they are apt to find its filthiness, brutality, and hypocrisy shocking. Quote, every line about bringing culture to the bush is a fairy tale, and a bad one at that. Observing this reality, I am truly proud that Poland has no colonies. Dismissing an Englishman's claim that the natives would not know electric light, tramways, telegraphs, telephones, and other marvels of modern technology if not for their civilizing presence, Novak wrote, yes, it is true that Europeans brought with them the miracles of the 20th century, but they built them with the labor of the locals and only for themselves, and the native still lives in the dust of the street or in some dark warren that he lived in before. He eats as poorly as before with the difference that his body and his morals are not as healthy as they were formerly. Um, after several months in the Belgian Congo, while where Novak enjoyed his near complete isolation from the trappings of the modern world, whether in Catholic missions and villages sympathetic to those missions or alone in the bush. His experience with a few colonial engineers and prospectors in Katanda territory brought him back to his theme of the horrors, horrors of colonialism. Once men like them had appeared on the scene, he insisted, factories and mines began to sprout up like mushrooms after the rain, and the rumble of detonations tearing apart the rocks drowned, drowned out the roars of lions. Observing that the rich resources of Central Africa could support millions of its own people in prosperity, he asked why this was not the case. Above all, he wrote, we must take into account who claims these lands and for whom the current situ situation is favorable. The maps of Africa, of the sort one sees on school desks on which swaths of color demarcated colonial proprietorship, were in fact contrary to political reality. Because Africa is not a colony of given countries, but the colony of international capital. Newspapers the world over have spread the idea of building civilization and spreading progress, he wrote. Capital built up the idea of supreme patriotism, and when the blood of colonial wars has soaked the soil, it came here to direct its satanic plan of enriching the nations. From the womb of the virgin earth, gold, diamonds, and copper materials were extracted. People seeking to get rich quickly came in droves. Uh, again, I quote, the world of civilized people went crazy. 
Hunting for elephants, for lions, for negroes became a source of pride, the height of bravery. Ships full of cotton, rubber, oil, gold, zinc, tin, copper, platinum, diamonds, coffee, cocoa, sugar, ivory, animal skins, and God knows what else began to depart from African ports, taking everything they could. Those ships returned, bringing the refuse of the world in order to plunder the treasures of the dark continent with their, assist, with their assistance. Millionaires and billionaires arose, while the Negroes who did the dirty work for them remain 100% proletarians. So <coughs> he, he in, this, in this language, really exhibits, I think, an interesting perspective, right? Uh, this is what I tried to set up earlier. He is a European. He is racist and condescending to the darker skinned people that he sees, but he's also empathetic uh, as uh, someone who is poor himself, uh, who is also subject to the whims of global capitalism, who lost his job in a bank, who um, wanders for a living, uh, and who, um, uh, I, I, like Conrad before, sort of uses this perspective to cast, I think, a really sharp I'd critique on um, the, the horrors of, of, of global capitalism. So um, I just want to show you, I have more examples, but I think I'm running out of time. I'm just want to show you a few more pictures. Here's one of his photographs of Johannesburg. Here is a picture of the King of Rwanda with his automobile. Um, Novak had a very interesting experience with the King of Rwanda, who uh, he said spoke French like a schoolboy. Um, and, um, you know, had a large palace where he was sort of set up by the colonial authorities. Um, oh, here's another aspect of, of uh, Novak's gaze. Um, he would write his wife about how he wasn't sure what to do with all the nakedness that he saw around him. You know, should he send the photos back? But of course, he knew that this was titillating to his audience. He knew that they would find this interesting. This is the, you know, sort of the era of National Geographic doing the same sort of thing. Um, and he has some really interesting passages about um, how ephemeral the African girl's beauty is, that they sort of bud like, like, uh, like the, the trees and flowers in the rainy season and then quickly age um, like the landscape around them. Um, and I don't have any indication. His, his letters to his wife are, are, are always solicitous, always um, um, loving. I don't know if he, if he sort of sought relief with African women or, or with the prostitutes whom he saw around. He seems to have been um, a, a devout Catholic. Uh, that doesn't prevent one from doing that. I don't know. I mean, but, but we have no evidence that he, uh, that he saw the natives um, or that, he, or, that, or that he physically uh, interacted with these native women, but he definitely comments on it a lot. He writes about it and he takes these photographs. Fiedler, on the other hand, has these photos where uh, the women are, are like touching him. Um, uh, he really does seem like the, the interwar playboy. Um, Fiedler, Fiedler's really fascinating though. Uh, he's famous for having written the, the probably the definitive work about the uh, Division 303 of Polish uh, Air Force pilots who fought with the RAF, and he himself was one of them. Um, amazing life story. I mean, th these, these people are really quite fascinating um, and, and incredible. Here's a photograph of the South African Reserve Bank, taken from a distance, I think, as, as befits uh, Novak. Here he is seated with uh, Shilux, and, uh, and, and then to, to wrap up, um, here is global capitalism uh, sort, of, um, sort of coming full circle. Now people can take Kazimierz Novak tours. There's, there's a website uh, sort of dedicated to him. You can buy these books. Um, frankly, I'm grateful for all of this. I'm, gl I'm glad that I was able to meet the people who are involved, who have brought his story um, back to light. Um, but I, but I, I, I hope that I've been able to demonstrate uh, the ways that both tramping and poverty uh, and, and sort of his mode of transportation uh, and his experience with, with, uh, with sort of global capitalism affected um, his, uh, his critique 
and, and the way that he could have what we might call a, a non-colonial uh, Orientalism, but also um, a European, uh, a fierce European critique of global industrial capitalism in, uh, in Africa. Thank you for your intention. I'm sorry I've talked so long. We've got a few minutes, I hope, for, for questions. Yeah.